I'd like to tell you guys a little bit about an institution that I found extremely influential on my work. I'm sure you've all heard of Bauhaus at some point or another, and I'll try and give you an overview of how Bauhaus came to be and why its influence has lasted so long. This is Bauhaus. Yes, it was a house, or a building, or a group of buildings over the course of a decade or two. Bauhaus literally translates to building school, and that's the idea it was founded upon. A merger of two schools, a school of arts and crafts, and a school of fine arts. This led to the birth of what we now know as design. Things like architecture, industrial design, and even graphic design, where art isn't valued on merely its aesthetics, nor craft on simply its technical qualities. Prior to Bauhaus, you had arts or you had crafts. Bauhaus united the two in harmony. Let's set up a timeline here. Berlin, early 20th century, a booming city at the center of Europe's affairs. This is Germany, or the Weimar Republic as it was. Berlin is right there in the center. Walter Gropius is an architect and professor in Berlin. One of his early, most notable projects was the Fageswerk factory, a factory with glass walls rather than brick. Not only did this encourage the public to see what goes on inside, but it allowed the supervisors to get a better idea of what was going on on the factory floor. Within Europe's community of artists and designers, Gropius was a respected and extremely influential man. Not only did he have a great network of collaborators, but also a strong desire to influence and teach. And then there was this, the Great War. This little event really shook everything up, and it demanded a cultural, economic, and political shift all over Europe. It wasn't until 1919 that the war was finally over, and a movement to rebuild and restore had begun. The scene was probably something like this. So, to recap... We've got a fallout from World War, which left Germany, and, well, all of Europe, in financial and physical ruin. This did, however, allow for a growing art scene. A free republic, no censorship. There's not a lot of money to go around, but it's an inspiring place to be. People are eager to learn, experiment, and pull themselves out of this ruin. Here are some of the major art movements going on at this time. Constructivism. Modernism. What do these things have in common? Berlin wasn't just the center of politics. There are many artists living here and around Germany at the time. Perhaps you recognize a few of these names? Well, Gropius got in touch and asked them to be a part of his newly merged school, teaching under one roof with one philosophy. See, Bauhaus was a school. But the reason its legacy has lasted so long is because Bauhaus came to be a philosophy as well. Taking advantage of the cultural climate, Gropius and his team were able to push students to explore art and design in new directions. First philosophy, absence of ornamentation. Get rid of the things that don't matter. Here's some turn-of-the-century architecture. What is this? Right, Art Nouveau. Beautiful in its own right, but look at it. Does any of this elaborate metalwork serve any functional purpose? This is the pinnacle of form over function. And on that note, Function before form. Form before function. No more. Bauhaus allowed us to unite these two. Design is form and function. Here's your average Victorian doorknob. Still common throughout the turn of the century. It's functional, sort of. Not exactly an ergonomic masterpiece. And what's with the elaborate details? Do they add any real value? This is the famous doorknob Gropius designed. It's beautiful, and it's even easier to operate. It's a work of art which functions as state-of-the-art. Bauhaus also brought us the unity of quality craftsmanship with the ability to mass-produce. That may sound impossible, but the leaders at Bauhaus found a way to make it work by making design part of the entire process. This set of tables utilizing simple, straight cuts of wood, which could be produced and assembled by machine rather than a single craftsman. They nest together not just for convenient storage, but the ability to ship them more efficiently. This keeps costs down, especially important considering the economics of Germany during the period. Bauhaus didn't keep things simple because it was pretty. They kept things simple because it was a holistic view of the entire production process. Design isn't something you can add. It's the whole thing, from start to finish. Take something... Strip it down to its bare essentials. What does this need? 
And these principles weren't strictly limited to architecture or industrial design. Here's some artwork from those involved with Bauhaus. All good things must end, however. It wasn't that there was a lack of public interest or school funding or anything like that. These guys kind of ruined all the fun. Many of the artists involved weren't of German origin and were deported or imprisoned or killed. What do we get out of Bauhaus? Where can its principles be found today? Well, if you thought any of that furniture looked the slightest bit familiar, you'd be quite right. IKEA alone is probably one of the biggest empires following the Bauhaus legacy. Affordably mass-produced products, flat pack shipping, simplicity in aesthetics and assembly. And maybe even taking a page right from Gropius's history, Volkswagen built a factory of glass in Dresden for its flagship car, the Phaeton. Prospective buyers can come in and take a tour if they're not quite sold on the car yet. Supervisors can clearly see production status. And with modern innovations, advanced robotics and human craft are united once again. And we've even got some Bauhaus remnants in the Twin Cities, those crack stacks, or the Sky Ghetto, as it's so affectionately called. So were designed by Ralph Rapson, one of the early adopters of brutalist architecture, which was a direct descendant of Bauhaus. Simple, cheap, to-the-point design. Put into mass production after the economic fallout of World War II, buildings like this exist all over the world. The only grudge we should hold against this place is the fact that it needs a paint job to restore those Mondrian-esque panels to their full glory. So what can we take away from this? User experience, sustainability, innovation. These are today's buzzwords in design, and these are exactly what Bauhaus was teaching 90 years ago. It's still relevant. Everything is designed, some better, some worse, but whether it's a sofa or a spatula, design has to be considered from every angle. It isn't how something looks. Aesthetics are just one part of the equation. You can have something that's pretty to look at, but that's not design. Design is how something works, together, united, in harmony with its appearance. You can't have one without the other. So if you're interested in studying more about Bauhaus or any of the figures associated with the school, it's not too hard to get started. There's the Bauhaus Archive Museum in Berlin, which has many examples of furniture and industrial design objects on display, along with notebooks, sculptures, and even some of the models that professors built to teach with. There's also the Bauhaus building itself in Dessau, which is unfortunately just an empty building these days. But here in Minneapolis at the MIA, there are several works on display. Clay and Kandinsky have a few paintings, and I think there's a Mondrian in the permanent collection as well, along with some furniture from Brewer and Dell. Thanks for listening. I hope you've learned a little bit about Bauhaus and Gropius. If you have any more questions, I'd be happy to answer them.